everybody, and uh, thank you for joining the continuation of the continuing medical education program of the Army and American Medical Society. Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Sarman Sarkisian, who will be giving a lecture on uh, a lymphoma, a brief overview of new developments. Dr. Sarkisian is a board certified in internal medicine, as well as hematology and oncology. He completed his bachelor's degree in chemistry at UCLA and earned his medical degree at the University of California in San Diego School of Medicine. He then completed his um, internship and residency at Los Angeles County USC Medical Center. There he developed an interest in oncology and hematology and subsequently completed his fellowship training at the University of California, Irvine, Chow Family Medical Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Sarkisian is a, a practicing hematologist oncologist serving the cities of Ventura, Simi Valley, and Long Beach. He's also affiliated with the City of Hope as an associate professor. Dr. Sarkisian also um, is a board member of the Armenian American Medical Society, and we're also proud to have him on our CME planning committee. Dr. Sarkisian, please go ahead and take this platform over. The platform is yours. Thank you for the warm introduction. And I've been really looking forward to this. I just love talking about lymphoma, teaching about it. So, and there's a lot of exciting things going on. So I will take over from here and start screen sharing. Okay. So the topic I put together um, is titled Lymphoma, a brief review and latest developments. And why I don't just jump to latest developments is because every physician, every person in America, every oncologist needs to re-review how lymphomas are organized. How are they how are they cut up and chopped and how do we get them straight in our head? And I think that's just really important, especially for, you know, for the hundred thousand some odd lymphomas that are diagnosed every year in the U S you know, you're going to have a lot of other specialists managing these patients. So, and it's always very confusing. So let's try and organize some of this stuff real briefly. So the first way we organize lymphomas is through immunohistochemical methods. Essentially, when you have a biopsy specimen, preferably an excisional biopsy, meaning the entire lymph node is taken out, less ideally a core biopsy and almost rarely a fine needle aspiration, your pathologist is going to really slice and dice this thing and do a lot of immunohistochemical staining to see what surface markers are going to pop up. And based off of which of these are positive and negative, plus on top of that anatomic characterization of the lymph node, then we can really come to a very close diagnosis of what it is. So for example, say we were to look at the third row follicular lymphoma, we know that it's negative for CD5, it's positive for CD19, it's positive for CD20, it can have CD23 negativity, CD10 positivity, which is important. And if you can see, that's one of the few that's gonna be CD10 positive. Negative for CD25, 103, 200. Um, and you know, based off of that and certain architecture features, they're gonna know whether or not this is a follicular lymphoma or not. And why that matters is because there's very specific conversations you're gonna have with the patient about prognosis, whether or not they need treatment, the type of treatment, and especially putting that into the context of you know, their desires for intervention, their age. And I do point out a couple of smaller entities on this list. CLL and its cousin B cell PLL are, are put on this list. And it has to do with the fact that it depends on who you ask whether or not these are characterized as lymphomas. CLL is technically a leukemia, but in a very advanced stage, you can have really bulky lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly. And some people do treat them like lymphomas, but they have a completely separate treatment algorithm that they follow. So let's start slicing and dicing and categorizing lymphomas. Anytime you have a lymphoma that you're suspicious of, whether it's based off a scan or a CT scan finding, the first question you ask yourself, is this Hodgkin's lymphoma or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Now, this categorization does remain a bit antiquated. I mean, Hodgkin's has its own treatment. And back in the day, that's really how they distinguished these. The vast majority of your lymphomas are going to be non-Hodgkin's. Hodgkin's is really one type. But as far as the medical literature is concerned, the vernacular, that's really your first categorization. 
Now, within your non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, you're going to have B cells and T cells. Don't be fooled by the arrow splitting this into two. Your first hunch is that it's 50-50. It's really 85% B cells and 15% T cells. Now, your next categorization is going to be whether or not these B cell lymphomas are indolent or aggressive. And if you have a T cell lymphoma, you're 15%. Your next question is, are the, is that an indolent or an aggressive type? So a typical clinical scenario is somebody who's presenting with constitutional symptoms, flu-like symptoms that don't go away, a lymph node mass in their armpit or their neck, their groin that's biopsied. The pathologist runs through the IHC staining that I presented on the first slide, and then it's categorized. Say, for example, you have a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Well, that would be a B-cell lymphoma that is aggressive. And here are some lists. So we have highly aggressive lymphomas, for example, Burkitt's and precursor B-cell, lymphoblastic leukemia lymphoma is technically a high-grade aggressive B-cell, some, ag some examples of just aggressive lymphomas, uh, your follicular lymphomas that are grade three, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, certain mantle cell lymphomas, and then you have a list of indolent lymphomas. And, you know, I'm not here to overwhelm you with the list. It's not something you would need to memorize. But it's just important to know that this is how they're sliced and diced. Now, that's just a laundry list. Now, like everything else that we categorize in life, we create lists and then we add weights to them. That's just sort of the anatomy of a situation. And then we'll talk more about the physiology of lymphomas. So with your lymphoma subtypes, you could see the biggest pie chart document is gonna be your diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And it is, it is one of the most aggressive lymphomas followed closely by Hodgkin's lymphoma. So these two are taking up about 60% of the lymphomas that walk through the door. And the good thing is most of these are curable. And to a smaller extent, you have your folliculars, your mantle cells, T cells. So now we've sort of got that straight in our head. When, when someone tells a lymphoma, you always ask yourself, is it a B cell or is it a T cell? And is it aggressive or is it indolent? After that, that's what everything is telling you under the microscope. Now, clinically, you're looking at the actual patient in front of you. How is the lymphoma staged? Well, stage one is really going to be one lymph node chain on one side of the body. Stage two are going to be two non-contiguous lymph node chains. As you can see, you might have cervical and axillary adenopathy. Stage three, you're hitting both sides of the diaphragm. If you're above and below, you're stage three. Stage four, you're starting to see non-lymph non node involvement, whether it could be um, actual pulmonary nodules, bone marrow involvement, um, deposits in the lung, skin, that's when you're hitting a stage four. And the vast majority of patients are gonna be stage four at presentation, but don't let the stage four scare you because having stage four colon cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer is very different from having stage four lymphoma. And I'll get to that in a little bit. So, okay, so we're going back to a generic case. You have somebody that presented with symptoms, a bulky mass under their armpit, flu-like symptoms that haven't gone away. They've lost weight without trying. You know, you've done an excisional biopsy. You've stained them. Now, for example, you have a 65-year-old gentleman that you know has diffuse large B-cell lymphoma based off the biopsy. The next question is, okay, we need to stage you. How do we do that? PET scan because it's gonna be better than a regular CT scan because it's gonna give you more information about subtle positive deposits that a CT scan cannot find. And on top of that, your PET scan, which has a radioactive fluorine component is gonna essentially give you a heat map in layman's terms. How hot are these nodes that are lighting up? So next. All right, so now we have a generic patient who has been diagnosed in stage. Now he shows up in your clinic, all right doc, I have stage four diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. This sucks, I'd like to get back to my cycling. What are we gonna do about this? So then you ask yourself, I'm sure you've done your research online, sir. Yes, I have, I'm very confused. There's so many things out there. Even my primary care doctor is confused. Well, that's where the oncologist comes in to help organize some of your thoughts and help organize your treatment. And this has really just exploded. It's gotten out of control just the last 10 decades, which is great. We have a lot of options, a lot of treatment options out there. And I've sort of laid them out on this array right here. You know, we have steroids, which are, you know, literally the same steroids that are used in so many subspecialties in medicine. They are active in lymphoma management. We have radiopharmaceuticals. We have CAR-T, chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy. We have radiotherapy surgery to some extent. 
by, by specific T-cell engagers, chemotherapy, the backbone of a lot of treatment. We have transplant, both autologous and allogeneic stem cell transplant. And we have this giant umbrella term called targeted therapy, a lot of things. So how are these confusing lymphoma treatments sequenced? How do we sequence these? Well, it really depends on the type of lymphoma. If you're talking about a Burkitt lymphoma, a diffuse large B cell lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, CLL, they're very different. We follow the National Cancer Center Network guidelines and to some extent specific authors on up to date, for example. But I've put together a little summary of just a couple just to see what our thought process is like. So for example, say we have a new diagnosis of splenic marginal zone lymphoma. The first box we start with, is this a hep C patient? Yes or no? Say for example, all right, we're gonna follow the algorithm. Your patient has hepatitis C. This is followed up with, you know what? Let's do antiviral treatment if they have not been treated and see if we can get regression of the lymphoma. You give them antiviral treatment. If they respond, you simply observe the lymphoma. If they don't, then you ask yourself, are there any indications to treat this patient? Are they symptomatic? Was this just an incidental finding? If there's no indication, you observe. And, you know, I mean, and I bring this up as an example, just to show that not all lymphomas are gonna require chemo upfront. Now for this sequence in particular, if they do have any reasons for treatment, then you can consider splenectomy or rituximab, no chemo involved. Now we'll look at a case of somebody with relapse, refractory, diffuse, large B cell lymphoma. Say for example, the gentleman I brought up, he was diagnosed with diffuse large B cell lymphoma. You give him you know, five months of standard treatment and this unfortunate gentleman has an early relapse. Say for example, we follow the algorithm. The patient has early relapse, yes. Is there central nervous involvement? Yes. Then you need to manage the CNS manifestations for it. If they don't, then you should really consider them for CAR T therapy. Then you always ask yourself, is the patient a candidate for stem cell transplantation? No, then you really sort of do a case by case management for this patient. If the patient is a candidate for stem cell transplantation, then you go on to salvage chemotherapy. And from there, you can consider CAR T therapy um, and then on to the transplant if they do qualify. And, you know, there's algorithms like this for all the different lymphomas and the different stages. I just wanted to highlight what a couple of these look like. So, so going on to chemotherapy, there's a lot of regimens out there, a lot of drugs. It's very hard to get these organized in your head unless you spend some time and look at them. And they really just really fall on a really nice clean spectrum. So I put this pictogram together to sort of lay them out. So on the right side, we have the less toxic regimens, right? We have P just by itself, which is prednisone. In a very old patient with a very, in a very certain scenario, you may simply just give a patient prednisone to manage them. It's very extreme, but that's how it is. Certain patients may just need a combination of prednisone and rituximab, a monoclonal antibody. Some patients could be treated with a single chemo agent plus rituximab, bendamustine rituximab, we can uh, notch this up a bit by adding a couple of chemo agents, RCVP. Um, your standard treatment for diffuse large B cell lymphoma is gonna be RCHOP. That's the backbone for certain lymphoma treatments. Mm -hmm. Adding on another agent, etoposide, gets you into RP epoch. Now this starts to get complex. This is gonna be a 48 hour infusion, mm -hmm. which you're gonna do in the hospital because it's gonna be a continuous nonstop chemo infusion. And then at the other extreme is going to be R codox M IVAC. This is for very aggressive mantle cell lymphoma. So it really depends on where the patient is as far as symptomatology, the aggressiveness of the lymphoma, what's the patient's age, how aggressive do you want to be in trying to cure this patient? Radiotherapy. You know, some people ask, why are we still utilizing radiotherapy, you know, 60, 70 years after it was invented and not really changed, it seems a bit barbaric and draconian if you ask some people, but it really has a role in certain scenarios. So some questions I've come up with, which we can ask ourselves is, what is the role of radiotherapy in the management of say non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? And it does have a role when patients have limited stage disease, as in if you have stage one, some stage two disease, 
where you could treat the patient with a few cycles of chemo and then consolidate with radiotherapy, those are going to be your best patients that are good candidates for radiotherapy. What's the role of radiotherapy in the management of Hodgkin's lymphoma? As a, actually a much higher role than non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, especially if they have bulky disease, mediastinal masses that are at least 10 centimeters in diameter. So it actually has a very fixed role. And anytime you have patients with lymphoma, it's always best to work closely with a radiation oncologist to see if the patient's going to be a good candidate. What are the long-term consequences of radiotherapy? And, you know, this is something we really have to think about, especially with the younger patients and especially very young patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma, because, you know, you don't, you never want to simply refer to a radiation oncologist and say, just give them radiotherapy. You want to ask themselves, uh, what are the real benefits of radiotherapy for this patient? And what are the long-term consequences? Because if you're going to radiate, um, you know, somebody's chest when they're in their mid-20s, you really have to think about, long-term consequences, atherosclerosis, valvular stenosis. So another question that comes up is radiotherapy the same as radionuclide therapy? And a lot of times I would put this into the same confusing category as, you know, why is magnetic resonance uh, imaging given a name when it's technically nuclear magnetic resonance? Because nuclear can mean a lot of things. So radiotherapy is for all intents and purposes, high energy electron therapy. You're shooting high energy electrons. You are not shooting protons, but there is a small niche in the radiotherapy world where they use high energy protons, but that's a very niche indication. So for, for, most, for most patients, when you hear the term radiotherapy, you're talking about high dose electron therapy. Radionuclide therapy, um, which is utilized in some cancers and technically refractory follicular lymphomas, is actual uh, radionuclide therapy where you have a radioactive isotope, which is emitting either alpha or beta particles uh, and killing the, chemo uh, killing the cancer cells in a very particular vicinity. It's very niche. I would say probably maybe 2% of lymphoma patients will ever see this in their lifetime. So, but it does technically remain on the table even though there's certain manufacturing limitations. And here's just a quick schematic. And again, I'm not a radiation oncologist, but I just wanted to show how when you have a patient with lymphoma and you're offering radiotherapy, you're not treating their entire body. You are really directing the radiotherapy at a very particular anatomic site. And it does take a week or two for these treatments to be put together as a radiation oncologist, dosimetrist, and the physicist work together to put together a plan for a very particular patient just so they can target a very particular area and minimize the collateral damage that they're going to experience. Targeted therapy. What is targeted therapy? Well, you know, the term really came out about 20 some odd years ago and it had to do with the development of imatinib, which is a drug used to treat CML. CML is not a lymphoma, but it's a bit like the poster child of essentially what's been now termed targeted therapy, not to repeat myself, meaning, you know, traditionally chemotherapy was used. Chemotherapy was not specific to any cell in the body and it was not specific to any receptor on a cell surface. Chemotherapy was this blunt crude instrument that worked, but with a lot of collateral damage. Targeted therapy really came about when people became more sophisticated and the scientific techniques got better in figuring out how cellular uh, mechanisms and pathways worked in cancer cells, what proteins are involved. X-ray crystallography techniques got better where they were able to come up with really nice 3D structures of these proteins that are involved in the cancer cascade and develop small molecules that hit these proteins with minimal um, action on off-target proteins. So the term targeted therapy was developed. You know, so for example, if you were to use acalbrutinib, um, which is a pill for marginal zone lymphoma or xanabrutinib, its cousin, you are hitting the BTK protein, brutin tyrosine kinase with a small molecule. So that would be an example of a targeted therapy. So how is targeted therapy different than chemotherapy and radiotherapy? It, it's very specific to a cancer type and a very specific to a particular protein on the cancer cell. 
Radiotherapy is geographically constrained. Chemotherapy is completely systemic. Any cell that takes up chemotherapy is going to get hit. There's no way to target a very specific cell with traditional chemotherapy. What is the future of targeted therapy and the management of lymphoma? Um, that is a very open-ended question, and it looks to be very bright. As we get better and better at you know, doing high throughput drug screening, finding targets, uh, developing better clinical trials, um, we are just going to see more and more targeted therapy on the market. It's just very good for cancer patients. Stem cell transplant, also known as bone marrow transplant. This can be a very confusing term for patients and families, and you know, even some doctors, for example. There's really two types of bone marrow transplants. You have your autos and you have your allos. Autologous, allogeneic. When you think of the scary stories of stem cell transplant, bone marrow transplant, you're thinking of allogeneic. They have a much stronger role in the, your leukemia patients, but they still have a place in lymphoma, probably 1% of patients. Autologous is really just a salvage mechanism when you're giving somebody high dose chemotherapy. So a lot of the chemotherapy agents I described earlier, they're still what I would call user-friendly. Your, your typical oncologist can manage this in a community hospital or in their clinic. Like everything else, you know, there are strong chemotherapy agents. And the one that's used in autologous stem cell transplantation um, is so toxic that it would wipe out your marrow and it would essentially take forever uh, or you may never recover your bone marrow infection and you would die from an infection. So what they do with autologous stem cell transplant is for patients who have refractory lymphoma to chemotherapy, they use autologous stem cell transplantation as a bridge to other therapies, perhaps CAR-T, perhaps um, uh, other systemic therapy in the end, or they just try to cure them. And essentially you harvest the patient's bone marrow, you give them high dose chemotherapy, which wipes out their bone marrow and along the way wipes out whatever lymphoma they have. And then you reinfuse their stem cells back into them so they can repopulate their marrow and regain their red blood cell function, platelets and um, immune and the white blood cell function. Autologous stem cell transplant has more of a role, as I mentioned, an allogeneic stem cell transplant in both types of lymphomas, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. Um, as I mentioned, allo still has a role. Some transplanters will choose to do allo in certain patients, but it's really a nuanced topic and probably beyond the scope of this conversation. And in general, with the development of CAR-T that I will go into in a little bit, um, CAR-T is starting to have a more dominant role than um, transplant in the lymphoma world. So CAR-T, this is the most exciting topic right now in the lymphoma space. So what it is, CAR-T chimeric antigen receptor T cell treatment. It's ex vivo autologous lymphocyte genetic manipulation. And what that means is ex vivo, it's occurring out of your body, autologous meaning it's your own. Lymphocyte is white blood cell. Genetic manipulation is, well, genetic manipulation. So if you have somebody with refractory lymphoma, what you're gonna do is harvest their white blood cells. You're gonna send them off to a lab. They're gonna do genetic uh, modification using a lentivirus. Essentially, they use a virus to plug in a new DNA sequence in the white blood cell. And the white blood cell will learn to re-recognize lymphoma cells when they're infused back in. So it's sort of re-educating your immune system to attack your lymphoma cells. Patient selection is crucial. You don't want patients who are really sick because this therapy does have a lot of side effects. You also don't want them to have too much disease. So you may have to hit them with more chemo just to shrink the amount of lymphoma they have. There's a lot of grade three and grade four toxicities. Patients can have neurotoxicity, meaning they get very altered stroke-like symptoms. And really these CAR-Ts are managed at tertiary care centers. You know, For example, in Southern California, probably about six or seven centers that are going to be doing this. UCLA, USC, Cedars-Sinai is going to be doing them. Um, UC Irvine, San Diego, Scripps might be doing them. So for, for a population of, you know, 15 to 20 some odd million people in Southern California, LA to San Diego County, you're looking at, you know, six or seven centers total that can manage these because there's just a lot of nuances involved. So 
and they're very expensive. I mean, you're talking somewhere on the order of maybe four to a five hundred thousand dollar bill just to manage these patients. And if they have a complicated hospital course, you know, the bill only goes up from there. Some insurers don't want to pay for it. And sometimes they will just serve as a bridge to transplant or another consolidation. So, you know, the, the experts and thought leaders are really sort of teasing out the proper algorithms for these. Immunotherapy, I mean, this has been another buzzword and CAR-T is technically under the immunotherapy umbrella. But for all intents and purposes, when I say immunotherapy, I'm specifically talking about the PDL1 CTLA4 axis. Um, you know, this is one of those game changer types of therapies that actually landed Dr. Allison the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago for his work on CTLA4. These are antibody treatments. They're more or less innocuous. 95% of patients will get these therapies if given as monotherapy, not feel anything. The labs do great. 5% of patients might run into some problems, but you know, the cost benefit analysis is just unbelievable on these patients. They do have a certain role in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, primarily, primarily your mediastinal diffuse large B cell lymphomas. They have a huge role in Hodgkin's lymphoma, and they may actually be pushing out some of the chemotherapy drugs in the first line setting. They may even replace transplant. It really depends on how the data pans out. So and it's specific for the PD-1, PD-L1 targeting therapies. We don't really need biomarkers, as in we don't need to do special testing to see whether or not patients are candidates for this drug. If they meet a certain profile, you just give it to them. And overall, as I mentioned, very, very low toxicity profile. Okay, so I wanted to run through a quick case. So we have a 72-year-old retired professional bingo player brought into the emergency room by his wife. He lives in a senior citizen center. He states he has just felt very fatigued and short of breath for the last several days. He has not seen his primary care physician in over three years. He does not take any prescription medications and denies any chronic medical illnesses. Physical exam reveals palpable splenomegaly and inguinal adenopathy. CT scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis reveals diffuse adenopathy in the hilum, mediastinum, paraaortic lymph nodes, iliac lymph nodes, Excisional biopsy reveals a follicular lymphoma. A bone marrow biopsy shows involvement with lymphoma. Which of the following modes of therapy is most appropriate for this patient? So, you know, working through a case like this, what are some of the things we're thinking about? We're thinking about the age, gender really less of an issue when it comes to lymphoma. Performance status, I mean, he's living in a senior citizen center. It makes you wonder how much of his activities of daily living he can handle. Not really taking any prescription medications, not really seeing a doctor on a regular basis. You know, he is symptomatic. He does have marrow involvement. So he already has stage four follicular lymphoma. But as I mentioned, not all stage four cancers are created the same. So we have some of the chemo options available. We have RCVP, our EPOC, our CHOP, and our bendamustine. So if you remember what I mentioned earlier, the intensity of the chemotherapy regimen literally is correlated to the number of um, letters in the acronym. So RB is going to be two drugs, while our EPOC is going to be six drugs. So I think for a 72-year-old with some issues with activities of daily living, but symptomatic, not really too many other comorbidities, I would go with D. The correct answer is D. Bendamustine rituximab is the most appropriate mode of therapy for this patient. Studies have shown that RCHOP provides no overall survival advantage over RFC and RCBP. Other studies have shown that VR offers the same efficacy while the progression-free survival of the other agents is better than RCVP. The associated toxicities would not be ideal for a patient of this age. So that's just one case that I just you know, put together as an example that represents how we think about these patients and how we manage them. Case two, you're seeing a 67-year-old Caucasian gentleman for the first time. He was diagnosed with stage three mantle cell lymphoma. A review of his pathology report shows that he has a 35% key 67. So that's a marker for how aggressive the disease is. And 35% is moderately aggressive. He's had significant fatigue from his underlying disease. After a discussion of several treatment pathways, he states he would not be interested in a transplant at all. He does, however, agree to chemo slash immunotherapy. You start the patient on RCHOP and after six cycles, he achieves a complete remission. Four months later, he unfortunately shows a relapse disease. His LDH is elevated to 350 international units per liter. 
CVC shows a hemoglobin of 9.7 and an albumin of 3.2 gram per deciliter. He has an ECOG of one, meaning he's not in the best shape. He does spend some time resting every day. Physical exam shows a mild pallor and he's a bit fatigued appearing. What would you recommend from the following options? Our EPOC, are we gonna escalate? Our bendamustine, which is a two drug regimen, xanabrutinib, which would be a targeted agent. We have a CAR T therapy option, brexacaptogene autolucel. Anytime you see autolucel, auto meaning from self, loose meaning leukocyte, white blood cell, or allogeneic stem cell transplant. The correct answer is C. For patients who have aggressive stage three and stage four mantle cell lymphoma, those who are not candidates for stem cell transplant or who have relapsed disease relatively early should be considered for BTK inhibitor therapy. Bendamustine rituximab is not an appropriate salvage regimen. Brexacaptogen autolucel will be appropriate after failure of a BTK therapy. Xanabrutinib, Fabrutinib, Acalbrutinib are all valid options. Our EPOC would not be appropriate because five of the six agents are exactly the same as ARCHOP. And the tumor biology has shown resistance to these agents. Allogeneic stem cell transplant is more appropriate in younger and fit patients, but is reserved for those who are not appropriate for CAR T and have proper disease control. So, you know, the sheer number of cases we can run through is endless. I could probably, you know, do an eight hour session just running through lymphoma cases. But these two, I think, really nicely summarize a random sampling of what we think about as oncologists. So let's chat about some of these newer developments. I mean, CAR T, as I mentioned, um, one of the most exciting, what I would call platforms out there. It really is a platform because you're creating a mechanism through which a lot of different therapies are going to come out. So starting with step one, you know, we have patient or donor blood that's going to be taken. You're going to isolate your T cells or the NK cells, depending on the pathway. You're going to Inside, you have the chimeric antigen receptor gene, which you're going to insert using a virus. And then your CAR T cell or the NK cell is going to be replicating this, and it's going to develop a certain protein on its cell surface that can recognize the cancer cells. And then you're going to expand the CAR T or the CAR NK cells. And when this is ready to go, you infuse them back into the patient. And when we look at this schematic at the bottom, you can see your CAR T cell or the CAR NK cell talking with your cancer cell recognition proteins on other immune cells and ultimately leading to destruction of the cancer cell. And when you look at the bottom left, you can see the entire family of proteins that people are trying to engineer that will show up on the cell surface of these cards. Antibody drug conjugates are another really, really exciting corner of the lymphoma space. There's already a couple available right now. Now, Monjuvi is one of them. And how these are different is, you know, monoclonal antibodies were developed about three to four decades ago. They are technically targeted therapy, but, you know, the outcome really depends on what you get out of this antibody binding to a certain protein and what happens downstream. But what people realized is we know that these antibodies will find their target and get taken up into the cell. So how can we develop a Trojan horse? Well, you slap on a traditional chemo agent, you bind it to the antibody, and once it's taken in, your child, the cell will chop up the antibody, it releases these small chemotherapy agents, and it kills the cancer cell. But the nice thing is your healthy cells that don't have proteins that the antibody drug conjugate can bind to will not really feel anything because the chemotherapy is not going to be taken up into the cell. Antibody-based therapy is as traditional as it gets, but there's still developments, there's still new targets. And essentially a quick schematic of how they work is when you have a specific target, say CD20, you engineer an antibody that targets this, it's taken up, it's internalized by the cell, and whatever cellular pathway is disrupted downstream will lead to cell destruction. And there's a couple of different mechanisms, but I think they're a little bit beyond the scope. So another example of an antibody drug conjugate is gonna be polituzumab vedotin. Um, this antibody drug conjugate in particular was so powerful that it's now become an chemo replacing option 
in the management of lymphoma, which was really just unheard of for about 30 decades. And you could sort of see in finer detail what's going on as the antibody drug conjugate is internalized, everything in blue is your antibody. And then your linker is just a small peptide series that connects to what we call the payload, little blast icon here. And once this sucker is taken into the cell, the endosome chops it up, it degrades it, and all your little um, highly potent chemo particles are released and start killing away. Another example is in Lanta, and this is and the reason I put this here is I wanted to show you what the linker looks like. You know, you have a sulfide bridge, which is common with these linkers, and then you have a sort of a peptide chain, your va your valine, alanine, or your standard um, amino acids, and then you have another PABA linker, and then finally, whatever payload you think of, you could put over there. And usually, these are very potent chemotherapy compounds. So the next thing we have to talk about is where are we with salvage chemo regimens? So say, for example, the original stereotype we introduced, we have an older gentleman diagnosed with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. He gets treated with RCHOP. Four months later, he has recurrent disease. Now what do you do? By the time you get this gentleman into a tertiary care center, it might be months. They might tell you, you got to get this guy's disease under control before we can do any sort of CAR-T. Well, you have some chemo options. You have RICE, you have RESHAP, RDHAP, RGEMOX, RGDP. Now, each of these letters is an acronym for a very particular chemo agent, but this entire option menu has not changed in about 30 years. And when patients are refractory to primary chemotherapy, you know, you got to get them into a CAR-T or a transplant program. But if they have a, a lot of bulky disease, you got to get that sucker under control they're, they're, or they're not going to qualify. And if they fly through these, you know, the prognosis is very grim. And these are very toxic regimens. Targeted therapy. So I just wanted to briefly talk about where we stand with targeted therapy, because this is really right at the pre precipice. We are at the forefront of where we're going with lymphoma. And this was the dream of a lot of uh, cancer therapy developers to develop pills that patients can take for lymphoma so they don't have to get infusions. They don't have to have as many of the side effects. So I've broken them up into these six broad categories. You have your XPO inhibitor, Selinixor. This is a drug in and of itself, a class in and of itself. Very, very interesting how this came out. Your brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitors, ibrutinib, xanabrutinib, acalbrutinib. You have your proteasome inhibitors, bortezomib. You have your imids, lenalidomide. You have your PI3K delta inhibitors, capansilib, EZH2 inhibitors. And each of these represent a very particular protein either inside the cancer cell or in the cell surface. The BTK inhibitors, xanabrutinib, acalbrutinib, ibrutinib, they're initially developed in CLL, but they found their way into certain lymphomas. And here we can see what's going on on the surface of a B cell. You have your CD5 protein, you have your B cell receptors, you have your CD19 receptor, um, and then you can see the crosstalk that's going on and your BTK protein, which is a pop smack in the middle, center stage, that is where the small molecule inhibitors are just simply going to cross the lipid bilayer and hit that protein and inhibit it from essentially telling the cancer cell to progress. PI3K delta, when we look at the mechanism of action, of course, it's occurring inside B cells. You have crosstalk going on between a lot of different proteins. You have AKT, PIP2, PI3K delta. Taze metastat. So this is one of the newer drugs that's been available. And interestingly, it was first approved for patients with follicular lymphoma refractory to multiple lines of therapy with a very particular mutation, the EZH2 mutation. And then they realize whether or not you have the mutation doesn't really matter as much. You can still give the drug to the patient and it works. And what's really interesting about this drug is that it's really affecting these proteins that have to do with the chromatin structure, you know, very, very new angle in the world of um, lymphoma treatment. So a lot of exciting things going on. So that sort of summarizes my talk. And I wanted to just sort of retrace some of my steps 
as far as where we are again with lymphoma. Everything, everything in lymphoma hinges on diagnosis. And how do we get a proper diagnosis? Well, we always have a high index of suspicion for A, malignancy, B, lymphoma. Whether a patient is presenting in an urgent care, an emergency room, a physician's visit, your typical presentation. Now, any lump or mass is pretty self-explanatory. You feel anything, just biopsy it. You know, unless you're so confident that it's a benign process like a lipoma. Any other vague constitutional symptoms always have a really high index of suspicion that somebody may have a malignancy or a lymphoma. It doesn't take much to sort of do a deep dive, do a quick follow-up with a patient. You know, if a patient is having these flu-like symptoms for a month that aren't going away, is it a rheumatologic process, you know, an autoimmune process? Is it a young female? Maybe they have lupus. If not, always keep malignancy in the back of your mind. And you know what? And now with the advent of telemedicine, we really don't have a reason to not quickly follow up with them a month later. If you're not fully convinced they have cancer, it's a really quick two minute phone call four weeks later to say, hey, Julie, I know you were having these symptoms a month ago. How are you feeling? Are you getting any better? If they got better, that's great. We'll follow up again one more time and call it a day. If not, maybe it's time for another physical exam, a CT scan, biopsy. As they say, tissue is the issue, no meat, no treat. And this cannot be any more true than in lymphoma. You really need to have a good, adequate specimen so you can properly diagnose these patients because the treatments are so fundamentally different. An older gentleman with follicular lymphoma is going to have We're good, Dr. Sarkisian. Continue, please. Just continue? Please continue. We're good. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Thank you. So as I was, uh, hang on one second, where was I? Sorry. Are you recording right now? Yes. Yes. Okay. There's some background noise. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, hang on. Where was I? My train of thought. Yes. As I was mentioning, um, you know, once you have a proper pathologic diagnosis, say it's a follicular lymphoma, a mantle cell lymphoma, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, the treatments are different depending on the patient's age. Um, you know, the treatments are going to be variable to a young patient with curable Hodgkin's lymphoma that is not responding to first line therapy, which is say ABVD, is it going to get escalated to be a cop therapy. An 85 year old patient with you know, follicular lymphoma that's starting to be symptomatic, but they spend most of their time laying around in bed, you might just bring them in for a few infusions of rituximab, give them prednisone and just call it a day. The, the options are so variable. Somebody with really indolent CLL, SLL, they could just be watched for years without having to give them any therapy. You know, uh, somebody who's young and fit, who has a really aggressive diffuse large B cell lymphoma flying through first line, diffuse large uh, therapy regimens like RCHOP, EPOC, you may not have to hit them with really nasty salvage therapy and then refer them for CAR-T transplant. The sheer number of scenarios are just so complicated out there. It's even hard for the lymphoma specialist to keep up. And if, you know, and if the conversation being for a lot of oncologists, if you feel like a patient might be better served at a tertiary care center, then they may actually need to be referred to a tertiary care center for proper management. So, you know, with that, I will conclude my talk. And, you know, I hope if you have time, go out there, read about lymphoma, re-educate yourself, you know, see how they're being categorized now. Look at all the new treatments out there. It's just becoming a really nice plethora and hopefully one day a cornucopia of options for our patients. And I really thank you for your time. And I hope you really took something away from this.